today uh, we have <coughs> Frank Jiao. Uh, I mean Jiao Yi. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, work in very much in progress, uh, evaluation of damages and business in breach of contract, American, in, uh, French, and international uh, contracts. So, Frank, I'll give you roughly 20, 30 minutes to do a presentation, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Vic, and uh, thank you for all of you to uh, attend this presentation. So we are talking of valuation of damages. Uh, there is a very abundant literature on contract law. When it comes to damages, however, literature is much less abundant. And when we talk of quantum of damages, even less so. Uh, you can find some literature on tort uh, damages, on tort law damages. You can find some literature on damages for international arbitration, especially international investment arbitration. But those papers are mostly, not only, but mostly economist work. And you find barely no paper on contract uh, damages. So one of the reasons is probably that damages under quantum is a question of fact, not a question of law. So the first question is, why do we, should we care about damages to start with? Are we just losing time? as lawyers to discuss damages? Well, I would argue no, for two reasons. One is a very obvious one. Uh, when you are a practitioner lawyer, uh, your, client are, your clients are interested into the outcome of the litigation in terms of damages, much more than in terms of the law. But more fundamentally, I would argue that there are patterns in damages for contract breach and those patterns can fully benefit the law community. So the patterns which I will try to evidence uh, are here called scales for compensatory damages. They can be observed from precedence. When uh, it comes to damages, there are two traditional difficulties, judicial uncertainty. Basically, no one knows today when they go to litigation what would be the outcome. It's very, very difficult to predict. And technical complexity. If you want to demonstrate your damages uh, fully, you have to invest a lot of uh, expertise, so also uh, a lot of uh, expensive expertise. Well, this research uh, evidenced some consistent patterns and increasingly consistent patterns, albeit different rules and facts, from different jurisdictions, from different situations. And from this observation, we will argue that uh, scales can be an alternative, a possible alternative methodology, which is both objective, so more predictable for uh, anticipating damages uh, from litigation, and also simpler. Those damages scale can fully benefit lawyers uh, to start with, they can con contribute to the academic debate. Uh, damages should be a matter of facts and law, maybe, and not only a matter of facts. They can help parties and practitioners, as we, as we said, to start with in contract drafting. Liquidated damages clause is one of the consequences we will uh, suggest. Pre-litigation settlement, if there are patterns, then it's better to know them and decide whether we should uh, rather settle instead of going litigating. And if we, as parties, decide to litigate with our counsel, then what is the best methodology to evidence our damages? Hopefully, uh, we can um, propose that those damages will assist courts and judges in their rulings. So let's start with a brief reminder. This is a very simplistic reminder of uh, valuation of damages and the rules in the different jurisdictions, in the different law. French civil law, American common law, and some bodies of international commercial law, CISG and du droit namely. They are all three based on a common general principle, full compensation. However, when it comes to the practicalities, this general principle is not translated in the same way. First, liability trigger are only direct 
certain damages for French law, whereas in US law, reasonably certain and not necessarily direct, also indirect damages, which are called consequential damages. Default rules for remedy is expectation damages for US law, specific performance for French law. And only in case specific performance is not possible or cannot compensate, then expectation damages. Scope of damages, US law is covering mainly pure economic loss. So you don't have in general uh, emotional harm uh, recovery in US law, except certain situations. In French law, the rule says all harm should be compensated. There are other specificities such as uh, mitigated damages. Until very recently, mitigated damages was not part of French law. It is now uh, a very recent introduction in the new civil code, and it is not as uh, tightly uh, worded than the mitigated damages in US law. And there is this specificity in US law of new business rules. Until 20 years ago, new businesses would not be compensated for their damages in US law. Today, it has changed. International commercial law falls in between those two extremes, I would say, civil law and, and uh, American common law. What are the challenges when we do an empirical analysis of contract damages? One is the general challenge for all empirical analysis, the selection bias. We can come back and discuss about that later if you are interested. One specific challenge, however, we had to cope during this research is a very simple challenge to uh, find enough cases documenting the quantum. The ballpark is on three cases which are documented in uh, Westlaw, in LexisNexis, and other database. Only, uh, only one out of three is really doc documenting damages, either quantum of claim or quantum of grant, and even less uh, both uh, quantum and claim and grant. This is actually a mistake. It's not both. It's either or on the second line. And we decided to select a lot more, more than 200 cases, which were fully documented from the top jurisdictions and four. And to focus our empirical study for the reason we just mentioned, on cases where outcome is highly unpredictable, where we can bring value trying to rationalize, to predict a little bit more the outcome. So those are cases where there is typically limited reliance with no or low investment, low upfront investment, and cases where even if the defendant is found liable, expectation quantum is speculative. So no data are easily available, and this is uh, how we can uh, bring some value to, uh, to the game. We selected three types of business situations uh, fitting this description. The number one, so this is a column on the left-hand side, number one situation is a, what we call breach of an agreement to negotiate or an agreement to agree. Typically, two companies negotiating a mergers and acquisition deal, they are in exclusivity, they negotiate a due diligence, and one of the companies breaching the exclusivity, how can we evaluate the damage for the other party? It's not very easy, I can tell you. Second is damage to goodwill, business reputation, or image. This is what I've called moral damages for corporation. It's a little bit provocative because there is no such a thing as moral damages for corporation. However, um, this is typically the situation of, let's take the example of Whole Foods. They are a reputable franchise for organic food. If they realize one of their supplier is actually supplying non-organic food, then the supplier is breaching the contract. There is certainly a damage on this product for Whole Foods but there is a potential damage on the whole reputation for the franchise. How can we evaluate this reputation harm? Very difficult to. Number three situation is what we have called lost profits for new business, but this is really very typical and very specific to the US, so we didn't have any comparative analysis on this field. And uh, just to bear in mind, we have analyzed 30 cases in each cell in each jurisdiction and situation. 
And these are the cases on which we have based uh, the quantitative analysis that will follow. What did we measure? Again, we wanted to analyze quantum of flame, quantum of current, and we uh, measured the result, the winning result of, uh, of the plaintiff into two main, main ratios. One is the probability of grant. So what is, uh, how likely the court or the arbitral tribunal are to find defendant liable and hence to grant something to plaintiff. The second ratio is the grant to claim ratio, the percentage of the plaintiff claim quantum actually granted by the court when they find defendant liable. We wanted to understand how those percentages and how the grant quantum itself, so the absolute value of the grant, vary over time, uh, how they vary across jurisdictions, and how they vary depending on circumstances. Now, our research has covered about 12 circumstances, including the business risk of the claimant, including the previous experience of the claimant, the length of the negotiations, the uh, respective size of the party, the type of law firm they used. This is for further presentation, but today I would like to focus with you only on two circumstances which are actually very actionable for the parties. One is the claim quantum itself. How much do you want to claim after the breach has uh, happened and you are litigating? And the second is how uh, wh which type of methodologies are you using to evidence that claim? Starting from that, uh, what are the averages and patterns we could identify? First of all, most cases widely vary from averages. Let's take three examples here. The first box on the left-hand side describes the grant-to-claim ratio, and there is um, a repartition, a distribution of the cases, 153 fully documented cases, both on claim and grant, nominal value, and then the percentage. And what you can see is on the low uh, side of the grant to claim ratio, below 20%, more than 50% of the cases fall in this category. And on the higher category, more than 80%, so if you are claiming 100 and you get 85, you fall in this category, 29% of the cases. Leaving only one case out of six into the average category. So very, very minor portion. This is interesting because generally we think judges, when they have different difference between claimant and plaintiff, they just cut into the, the case and they give a, a Salomon judge a Salomon uh, uh, ruling, it's not the case. Actually, 80% of the cases are more extreme. Methodology sophistication, here I need to give some explanation. We have coded, by reading the cases, uh, we have coded four categories of methodology. The number one is basically when the claimant is giving a claim, let's say 150, with no detail of this claim, with no real rationale behind this claim. So we can say no methodology. Number two is some kind of qualitative methodology. The claimant gave the claim and give the detail of the claim into different portions, but does not explain quantitatively how the criteria or the factors influence that claim. Number three is a little bit more. They give the claim, the detail, and one rationale at least a qualitative rationale, sometimes a quantitative rationale. And the number four is actually when several multiple methodologies are used, preferably quantitative methodologies. So they would use a business plan, they would use DCF, discount, discounted cash flow, even though this is a very rarely used uh, methodology. It's supposed to be the golden third and we didn't find it very uh, many times. Um, but at least it is much more detailed and sophisticated methodology. Well, you can see that all the cases are evenly spread, or almost evenly spread into the four categories. And then the last box in the right-hand side describes the different types of damages in the different situations. So in situation one, remind it's a negotiation which is breached, 
mergers and acquisitions typically, reliance damages are on average a very low amount, a very small amount, less than one million, but the average recovery is more than 85%, which makes sense because it's quite easy to demonstrate reliance, you just have to prove you're involved. The second type of damage is actually much, much more interesting and we will focus on this one. It's still in situation one, but expectation general damages. So typically the two companies who are going to merge, one is reaching, but the merger was based on a business plan. And the party who is not breaching is using this business plan, so the expected uh, outcome of the merger as the basis for the claim. The average we found on our sample is $62 million, uh, so much more, with an average recovery rate between 33 and 45 percent. Those uh, percentages are actually true for France, for the US, and they exclude outliers, so I have put a note down uh, just for your information. And then you have two other types of damages. In situation two, again, uh, harm to reputation, image, expectation, consequential damages. The case I, I described for Whole Food, the damages on reputation or image is certainly not a general damage, it's indirect, so we call it consequential. On average, a small amount, more than one million, but much, much more, and the recovery very low, 10, 15%. And the lowest recovery was found in our sample for expectation general damages of new business. First pattern we identified, because <laughs> the averages are not really covered uh, many times, one uh, pattern is really the evolution of the grant to claim ratio over time. The, the trend is clearly down, downward for the US, and clearly upward for France. This is uh, illustrated in situation one, the US in red, uh, blue for France, and it would be the same pattern for situation two. It would be actually a similar pattern for the US in uh, uh, situation three with different values, lower values for situation three, higher values for international law. But what is important here is the trends seem to converge toward an average of 40, 45%, both for France and the US. So this is one explanation for the gap between uh, the different cases. Some cases are the early 90s, some cases are more recent, and they follow this pattern. A second pattern we identified is actually more interesting in terms of predictability. Largest claims get relatively lower recovery rates. We have done the analysis both in grant to claim ratio, in probability of grant, this is the slide you have here, but we have done also the analysis in absolute value of the, of the grant. But the shapes here are very similar, showing a negative correlation between the value of the plaintiff's claim and the probability of grant, which goes from 95% to 75% uh, when the claim is growing, and also a negative correlation with the percentage of that claim actually granted, the grant to claim ratio, which uh, starts around 85%, 90% in the very small claims until uh, less than 30% in the larger claims. Again, this is illustrated in situation two international, but it would be a similar pattern for France and the US, both in situation one, in situation two, and in situation three for the US. Finally, the third pattern is a little bit uh, more complex to explain. This is the influence of methodologies used by the claimant to demonstrate uh, the claim. What we find in a nutshell is a positive correlation between the sophistication of the methodologies used, you remember one, two, three, four, and the successful outcome of that claim. You have the bars which shows a probability of grant, blue bar is a probability of grant for France, Red bar is a probability of grant for the US, and the lines are the grant to claim ratio. So let's take the US for instance, you see the red line starting at zero when methodology is non-existing, to 65% when there is sophisticated multiple methodologies, 
and the, um, uh, the bar showing the probability of being granted climbs from zero to 100% on our sample. Obviously, this is an illustration in situation one, but it would be a very similar illustration again in situation two and three. In France, however, you can find a slight difference in methodology four. So some cases in methodology four actually drive the average down compared to methodology three. And the reason for that is not the impact of methodology, but the size of the claim. And here is a combination of the two criteria we mentioned, the negative correlation with the impact of the, the, the size of the claim and the positive correlation with the methodology. So what this seems to indicate, and we will try to, to demonstrate it, is that even though grant is growing depending on the methodologies and depending on the claim, it will, it will grow at a decreasing rate depending on the claim. We actually combined the uh, quantitative analysis of claim, methodology, and grant, and this is what we found using a software called MATLAB, which is basically an analysis of matrix. You don't need to uh, understand fully the equation, but basically what this says, it's an illustration in situation two, with a combined sample of US and France, but again, it would be the same in situation one. Um, if you take the, the equation, the second derivative of the grant with respect of the claim, as you can see, is negative, showing a decreasing rate of growth of the grant compare, compared to the claim. And even though the figures are small and obviously need to be validated, the second derivative for sophistication with respect uh, of grant with respect of sophistication is zero. So showing a steady growth with no change depending on the size of, uh, with no change depending on the sophistication. So if this uh, equation, this model is validated, it should demonstrate not only the different sign of the correlations, but also in the absolute value the fact that the claim impact has a bigger impact than sophistication. So consistent with the French example here in the blue part. In conclusion, uh, am I okay in time? <coughs> there are routes for further thoughts. Uh, if damages, scales, or patterns, if you want uh, to use this word, are demonstrated, one is a route for normative thought. Can damages be considered as matter of law and not only as matter of fact? If we demonstrate that there are patterns, that there is a trend, that there are some methodologies which are more effective in terms of results, then why not considering uh, damages and even the quantum and the methodology as a matter of flow and fact and not only of fact? There are some routes for prescriptions for parties and councils. Again, if uh, those patterns are demonstrated and validated, parties and councils should consider them in contract drafting. For instance, to define liquidated damages clause in case of a breach, then why arguing and why even litigating if we have a liquidated damages clause that can anticipate uh, litigation that would be probably more efficient. In pre-litigation settlements, so let's assume we could not put a li liquidated damages clause, and I can say uh, that it is very often the case in France, for instance, less so in the US. Well, when the breach happens, uh, we can settle based on those patterns. Again, if we decide to go litigating, then we'd rather use the most efficient methodologies in calculating the, the damages. Some routes for thought in judicial, um, I would say expertise or practice. One question we can ask is, should courts uh, be trained to use those scales and ranges as tools to assist their rulings? It's not the objective of changing um, their sovereign power. Uh, judges both in France, in the US, in international law are completely uh, sovereign in terms of the de deciding of the quantum but why not uh, providing uh, patterns if they exist? And finally, just in terms of business opportunities, 
um, my intuition is that there is certainly, again, if we validate the model, an opportunity to develop an efficient self-improving model with artificial intelligence. And if, again, this model exists, we can very easily uh, consider parties optimizing their claim depending on the outcome, depending obviously on the facts they can bring forward, but not claiming unreasonable damages they will certainly not recover or they would need to invest very, very expensive methodologies to demonstrate them and probably not very efficiently. Next steps are here. The robustness of the models should be uh, yet tested. Um, I would like to perform comparative behavioral analysis. I think the uh, Nobel Prize of Economy that was uh, decided today is an interesting route for uh, thinking on behavioral analysis. And uh, the objective for, uh, for me now is to draft an article based on the research paper you have been circulated. But uh, I thank you for your attention and your questions for now. Uh, I'll take questions. Let me just start with a, a naive question. Uh, you have the, uh, the, the, uh, the probability of a grant. What's the denominator? The probability of the grant? Okay, so that's a very good question. You are talking about this one probably, or this one? Yeah, yeah. So here what we, we took in the sample, we took ranges of uh, claim sizes and we average the probability they had to find the defendant liable, and we considered those ranges with the same uh, average probability of the grant. I'm sorry, one more time. I, I was so basically, what we uh, did is we split the ranges, the, the claims, into ranges of value. And by each value, we define an average, and this is how we define the probability of the grant. So it's basically if the claim is in this range of uh, value, this is the average probability they would be granted something, just by observing the averages. Well, I'll, I'll hold off on that. I'll come back to it. Uh, Bert. Oh, uh, you can. Uh, we'll come back to it. Bert, uh, pick up a microphone there. Oh, yeah. <coughs> I think the answer of your, to your question, Vic, is this slide I didn't show. So this shows the quantum value of claim and probability of grant. So what we took is a probability of grant made with respect of three ranges. This is in illustration in US, but similar methodology was used. Between 0 and 100K, between 100 and 1 million, and more than 1 million. And from each of those range, we identified the average probability and this is what we implemented. Hi. So um, two quick questions really about the data. One is whether uh, the US data have awards from both judges and from juries. And with, if so, it may be the, I'd be curious to know whether the judge, I mean, I'd, I'd be curious to know the difference, but also whether the judge data re you know, matches or comes closer to the other forums, France and the international settings where there are no juries. Second question is about the French damages. The French damages, it, the, are, are those all only after a court has already decided that specific performance is not available? And if so, then I'm not sure what we're comparing there because those seem like they could be real outlier cases. Yes. Um, Thank you very much. So one uh, answer to your first question. US cases covers the appeal. Generally, we took the court of appeal. So when there are juries, uh, we, we took them. When they, there is judges, we took them. One incident answer to your question is how they are consistent or inconsistent between judge and juries. It is true that judges are very, very often, especially in the past, much lower than juries, but as for all practical purposes, we took the last decision and we put, them, we put that into the, into the analysis. That's for the first question. For France, uh, specific performance is a default rule, but that doesn't mean there is no damages. As 
either a second rule if specific performance is not available or as a complementary to specific performance when specific performance does not cover everything, when there is a delay, for instance. So in that case, there are also damages. But I see in your question that implicitly we are comparing some, some damages which are not really comparable, apple with apple. Well, that's possible, you are, you're right. Some of them are completely comparable, some not completely, but the patterns are very similar. And we are not really interested into the absolute value of the damages, which we have seen are lower in France than in the US. We are more interested into the patterns and the recovery, the average recovery. Okay, I have two questions too. Uh, so the first question is kind of similar to the specific performance question, but what are you doing with those cases with liquidated damages? Uh, and how are you sort of trying to separate them and, and uh, what happens in terms of recovery? And then the second question is that I think in your earlier tables you talked about three different kinds of contracts. And the first one was about the agreement to agree or agreement to negotiate. I was wondering how many of those cases had um, uh, the duty to negotiate in good faith, uh, either expressly, expressly or impliedly by the contract, uh, by the court. Okay, liquidated damages is a, is a very good question. Unfortunately, I cannot answer this question. Um, what we can say is there are certainly different practices between France and the US in terms of how many contracts actually use liquidated damages clause. My intuition is that because of the judicial practice in the US, liquidated damages will be much more developed in the US than in France. And as a, as a practitioner myself, I didn't see so many liquidated damages clause in, in the French contracts. Yes? Are you including, I mean, especially when you look at M&A contracts? Yes. Are you breakup fees? Yes. That's possibly breakup fees. So here, bear in mind that we are considering only litigated cases. So there is certainly this selection bias between the different type of contracts, between the different types of jurisdictions. But again, it's not so much the overall uh, understanding of the cases we are trying to find, nor more the predictability of the outcome of litigated cases. So yes, some cases in uh, mergers and acquisitions have breakup fees, and if they come to litigation, it's probably because one of the party considers breakup fee is not reasonable in one side or the other side. And the judge has the authority. We have many cases in the US and in France where the judges have revised the, uh, uh, the breakup fee. The, 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 br the breakup fee, though, is not an agreement to agree. The breakup fee is actually in a contract. Uh, so you don't have breakup fees and agreements to agree. I mean, there are some, sometimes there are. Uh, Rick, sometimes there are. If you negotiate, for instance, what we call agreement to agree is, OK, we are in negotiation for merging our companies, and we negotiate an exclusivity. There is certainly not a final contract, but there is an agreement to agree eventually after the due diligence. Sometimes those contracts include more in the US than in France, but still, they include breakup fees, okay? If we litigate, we assume that this is just an assumption. I have no clue about how this influence. We assume that the liquidated damages clause is not reasonable for one of the party and they want to litigate. So this is, uh, for the first question, I, I realize it's not a full answer. I'm sorry for that because we didn't cover and maybe that could be a, a route for further analysis. Duty to negotiate in good faith, I would say it's somehow the same type of answer. I want to give you two um, concrete examples, which does not answer directly to your question, but gives some hints. Uh, we have one very interesting case in France, which was a famous case, it's part of the sample, where a partner, it's not a law firm in that case, it's an accounting firm, uh, retired and committed to sell uh, his uh, shares. He changed his mind for whatever reason and he wanted to litigate on the basis that his former partners have changed decisions. So really obvious bad faith. 
And the court used the bad faith of this claimant, because he came, to, uh, and I'm sorry, he was a defendant in that case, so the partner's claimant. So the court used the bad faith of the defendant to uh, justify very, very heavy uh, compensation damages with very simple demonstration. So in that case, the methodology was not very important. So it's a way to answer that, in that case, I didn't know the contract, but certainly the judges considered that the bad faith was enough to either to put compensatory damages which were full, and they actually recovered 75% in that case, in, in first instance 100% and 75% in appeal, but you can also consider they uh, used hidden punitive damages in a sense. So that does not answer your question, but we have also examples on the, on the other way around where we don't know why, but very high claims are not very well recovered, even though they are well demonstrated. We can assume that judges are taking a, a moral value on, on their ruling. Um, you, you point out correctly, I think, the, the two main limitations to understanding this. One, there's these cases are complex, and there's also, second, there's, there's missing data problems. And then you point out that the data you're looking at is, is, that's particularly true because these are cases that have gone to trial, and you suggest that those are cases in which data problems are the most problematic and, and they're the most complex. And in the paper, you suggest that you're hoping to use this data to understand the appropriate level of damages to award, and I'm wondering, if these limitations are true, how can you how can you use that same data to find out what is appropriate when they're limited by applicable statute? Well, I think I should correct the uh, sentence I used in the paper. I think this analysis is relevant. Uh, one, as I said, as an academic debate, because if the scales are demonstrated, then we should really consider why damages are not also a question of, uh, of flow, uh, of facts, uh, of flow, I'm sorry. But uh, more important, I think the value is to be well prepared in case of litigation. Avoid litigation in case you consider you have uh, less chance to recover, or prepare the litigation better. I'm not sure it is a way to decide the appropriate level of damages, because after all, we are not analysis. The we are not analyzing the uh, the actual harm. How can we analyze the actual harm? We are not doing that in those uh, in those litigation, basically. So uh, the first question is uh, maybe a follow-up of a part of the previous question, which is um, about how courts, how, how do exactly you want courts to use, right, because you say that it should be informative to the parties, which I understand, and to litigating lawyers, which I also understand, but then the question is how exactly you imagine courts should use what you offer them to use, because as just uh, you know, the previous question uh, stressed that we don't really know what is the right thing to do or not, we just have, uh, so this is the first question. The second one is, um, well, it's about those high claims, right, which you say that relatively, right, the, the, the ratio of uh, awards are relatively low. So I think that in the behavioral literature, I think that we could study from that literature that sometimes it could be a good strategy to claim for more because then you get, in, right, in absolute terms, you might take, so, so is there any way to see whether it's not just the you know, very high claims that, you know, that, that the re so uh, ideally we want to uh, see the ratio between the awards and you know the objective circumstances, right? The relationship between the objective circumstances of those uh, high 
value claims and the awards and not between the allegations of the parties because the parties might have a strong incentive, especially with high value claims, to inflate their claims knowing that that might affect them. Yes, thank you very much, Ariel. So those are questions on which I would like to uh, come back to this slide. Starting with the second question, maybe. The objective circumstances. Uh, I would not uh, claim we are analyzing the objective circumstances, as, as you uh, said before. However, we are analyzing some proxy of objective circumstances. For instance, in situation one, very clearly the length of negotiation. And we have demonstrated that there is a clear pattern. The longer the negotiation during the exclusivity period and the breach happened, then you are sure you, are, you have a better recovery than with shorter negotiation. In the same way, the importance of reputation for Cayman's business in situation two, even though, again, this is a coding, there is a circumstances. Previous experience of Clayman, this is really specific to new business situation three. The, 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 the company who has no previous profitable track record is very mm, difficult for, for them to demonstrate a future business plan. And you can see the claim are huge in that case and the recovery is like 5%, 5, 6%. So again, and, and there are so many others here, I did not describe everything. One very, um, surprising result we had is that overall larger law firms get higher results. Okay, that's re reassuring, right? Because they are paid more. Well, it's not always the case. In situation two, which is again a situation of reputation, harm to reputation, image, goodwill, very difficult to evaluate, and also smaller claims, only medium-sized law firm get better results. So you can have a different interpretation. Mine is, especially in the US, this claim is relatively recent. It's not recent in France. And being recent and smaller, only low or medium firms have found a profitable business model to serve them. This is just a hypothesis. So just to say, Ariel, that I don't have the direct answer to objective harm, but we have some proxies. So that's for, um, and, and you mentioned also the literature. Yes, there is a very important literature on anchoring. And actually I'm not inventing here anything because uh, many studies were published on anchoring in international arbitration, more than litigation, um, for whatever reason. So yes, the, the, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing against that. Um, how do we want the courts using those, uh, those scales. Again, we need to quantify, to validate all the models. But let's imagine there are, in those cases of contract, let's take situation one, a pattern that is commonly agreed, that is shared by the parties, that is shared by the academics, improved and maintained and updated. Practitioners will use them, but also based on the decision of the courts, it is a self-improving model. If you are a judge, you can tomorrow have access without any names, without any uh, confidentiality breach to the standard of this type of case. Again, we are talking of one particular case. And then you can use this tool as a support to your decision. It doesn't uh, impede you from choosing something else, but then you have to justify. And my intuition is in this particular case, we want to increase the predictability of the outcome. We don't want to, to constrain the judge. We want to assist them, but we want also to reduce what we call in France, l'alliage judiciaire. So maybe um, keeping the sovereign power, but reducing the arbitrary power. I don't know if I, I, I answer rightly. So um, I want to follow up on, so, on some stuff that we've talked about before. Um, can you put slide 12 on? I want to talk about, so the, the, two, the two most striking 
thing that, that, that you're presenting here are on slide 12, which is the larger claims getting lower recovery rates, and then slide 10, which is the convergence claim. So let's, let's, let's go to the... This one? Yeah, but let's, I, want, I, I want to talk about both of them. So, so first go to 12. So, um, so we've talked before uh, about my concern that the value of claim is not a good thing to think about it as an explanatory variable because it is in itself. Uh, well, at best, it's observed with great error, which means that the, 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 the relationships are going to be biased. Uh, at worst, it's endogenous, um, and how much you decide to claim uh, may depend upon some other things. But let, let, let's suppose that is in some ways an incomplete proxy for the, for the actual value of the thing, and for, you know, which would affect the slope and not the other things. I'm, I'm wondering what, how is this going to shape uh, the research pattern? That, that is, do we think, do we think this is going to hold up as we do more research? Do we think this will dial us back to the trust? Uh, and so on. The one, the one concern that I have, which I sort of, I can't remember whether I mentioned to you at some point, but I, I thought of it more recently. Um, there's a good reason in your sample uh, for high value claims to have a lower probability. Mm -hmm. um, because this is a stratified sample of claims that are being settled. Okay, and so we know that in order for a claim not to be settled, other things being equal, and I'm not on the way this literature, other things being equal, uh, a larger claim is more likely to make it into this pool. Which means that on average, in order to make it into this pool, the merits can be can be lower. Whereas in order for a low quality claim to make it in this pool, the merits have to be pretty good. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering how much, I, I, I understand that we can't say very much about the selection bias with regard to probability of win, but could this association between the size of the claim and probability of win largely Um, well, in that case... And, and if it is, what difference does it make? It might not make any difference at all. Okay. Depending upon how much, yeah. Yeah, so I think this is a complex question. Thank you, Avri. Um, let me try to cut into different slices. One is the claim and the grant. So we have made the correlation both with the percentage of grant to claim, but also with the absolute value of the grant, and we have seen that you know the correlation exists the decreasing growth, uh, if you wish, uh, depending on the claim. Now, coming back to um, the artifact of the selection, possible. However, the way we have selected the cases and the fact that the pattern is the same for situation one, two, three, France and the US, and in that case also for international. International is somehow different for methodology. But this is exactly the same pattern. The absolute values are different. Even the percentages may be different, but the pattern of decreasing is the same in all the five samples. So it would be really, again, it's not impossible, but it would be really uh, a, a bad chance that the artifact is on all samples the same way. I mean, I, I'm, not I'm not sure that that follows. I, I think that if, so long as there is some censoring in all the different systems, and if the censoring is weaker for larger cases, mm -hmm. which it should be, um, then, then you would expect to see different amounts of censoring for small cases and large cases in all three systems. C can you uh, elaborate what you call censoring effect? Um, I, I think a, a case that doesn't get broad, a case that, 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 does, that, that doesn't get settled. Okay. My personal feeling of the reason of this decreasing curve maybe is due to the artifact. I think it is mechanically due to one thing which is a fact. Yes. When a claim is higher, the defendant is also defending better. Yes. 
So, you know, they would invest better expertise on the other side. That is, uh, you know, an obvious truth. I would argue that this is a little bit more difficult to demonstrate. I have demonstrated it in five or six cases where it was obvious, and I mentioned one, is also the moral value, especially in France, but even in the US, judges uh, feel rep uh, very large claim, could be repugnant, I don't know how to use the, the proper word, but in five or six cases, we saw bad faith, we saw exa exaggeration, or unreasonable claim into the demonstration of the judge. Again, it's not a quantitative correlation or analysis by no means, but it's an intuition that can be built upon. You had a question on 10 also. No, Let me have, we'll okay. come back to that. Let me, I'm gonna follow up a bit on this. The, Which the one? one th uh, th this slide here. The one thing that's sort of puzzling is this, the values are so low. The, uh, the values are so low that, the, uh, that a lot of the arbitrations are less than $200,000. Uh, no, 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 oh yeah. So some claims are very small, right? Yeah. And the largest you seem to have here only about 1.6 million, which is not terribly large. Uh, the, let me give you uh, my one war story. Uh, I was involved in a uh, case, uh, an arbitration, in which uh, I was supposed to sort of try and debunk the, uh, the, cl the claimant's claim. Uh, but the claim itself started out about 40 or 50 million, and then as the proceedings went on, they kept on doing new models, and they got up to about 160 million. So I don't know which claim would count in your model. Okay. The, the, the actual value of this is probably about two million, but the judge, partly because of the uh, uh, being confused by all this, ended up with about a $20 million uh, result. But the the thing, uh, I'm just not, so that would give you a low grant to claim ratio, 20 to 160, but it was totally bogus since the actual value of the case was about two. How do you deal with that? Okay. Or don't you? Uh, so you, are, you have two parts, I think, in your question, Vic. One is, again, coming back to the actual damage, and I'm sorry I cannot answer because I'm not bringing much in this field. So if you estimate that the actual damage is two and they are claiming 20, I think our model here is not uh, intelligent enough. Now, coming back to your first question, which is the ranges of the values. So, I should be more precise about what we call international body of laws. Those are cases which are either international commercial arbitration, as you said, but not only. They can be also, quote, international litigation. A French company litigating with an American company under uh, US law could be classified into international, okay? So it's not only international commercial arbitration in that case. And it can be a German company with an Italian company litigating into, uh, you know, third law, French law in that case, because we are talking France and French civil law and US common law. So th the problem with the international sample, and that's why the results are less easy to interpret, there are CISG, there are unidroit, one of them is unidroit, and there are also some domestic law with international litigation. So I don't know if that answers your question. No, I'm still, and this goes back to Avery's point, that the numbers are so small, uh, particularly uh, uh, this big hunk here where you have high probabilities, that if you're gonna litigate, you're, you're, you're gonna get pretty close to the, uh, and win, uh, which you uh, did, you're gonna get pretty close to the amount, and uh, otherwise you're not gonna, afford it. Uh, I have uh, Josh is next. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me now? There it is. Um, so I think this is like great that you are um, that you are reading these cases and coding them in a way that shows a lot of thought and you know, clearly deep familiarity with the, the structure of the litigation, you're interpreting the provision. So I think that that's, <coughs> that's great. I, but I wanted to ask you about kind of your methodological approach, which, so at times, you know, you, you talk about random sampling, you randomly sampled the 30, and Avery was asking you about kind of attenuation bias, but I, I don't really see a statistical methodology in the project, right? So. I'm wondering how much kind of from a, you know, 
from a social science sort of you know inferential standpoint how much weight we can put on 26 data points right or 30 I mean I mean if we put you know standard errors around these it would be huge and I know you know that but I'm curious kind of how you think about because it's a it's a pretty big step right to say we're going to start you know making inferences about what courts are doing from from 30 cases right that that's a strong claim um, so I mean how, how you know kind of what informed your choices I'm curious was it just resource limitations or how do you think we should that's exactly the point. I think uh, I have said that from the beginning, the most important challenge is not the selection bias, in my view, is really the number of cases we got with quantum. Coming back to statistical analysis, I would not pretend uh, absolute statistical analysis. However, we, uh, for each of the situations, we have used keywords. Let's say, for instance, situation one, we have used a breach of contract, we have used damages, we have used exclusivity, due diligence, mergers and acquisition, agreement to agree, agreement to negotiate, so a certain number of keywords. And from this, you have seen about 300 cases uh, showed up. On those 300 cases, we then selected randomly one out of five. Until now, I would say this is random. But you're right, the final selection was not random, because we wanted to overweight the cases where there was documentation both of the claim, or at least either of the claim and the grant, and some other criteria in quantum. So you're right, it's not a purely random selection at the end, because we wanted to be able to analyze the quantum. I don't know if that uh, answers your think first my part. My question is just a little more fundamental. What, what can we learn from 30 cases? Okay, I would argue it's not 30 cases. Uh, I'm sorry for that, but as we said from the beginning, there are 203 cases which are documented. Now, if you say 30 cases by cell, which is by situation, by jurisdiction, I would agree. But again, if you have 30 cases in one particular situation which are consistent, well, I'm not a statistician, but I think that means something, especially if there are some patterns. And then, even more so, if you combine the different samples and you find similar patterns, then I think, even though we are not yet statistics, I think there are some lessons to learn. Many, many business situations are taken with much less number of samples. Hi, uh, I'm from India, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because in India we have a law which only recognizes uh, liquidated damages. Uh, so my question basically stems, I have two questions. One pertains to liquidated damages. That's one of your suggestions that uh, people should contemplate in advance what all damages would encompass in uh, so that recovery becomes easier for the court also to calculate. Uh, but what happens in liquidated damages is that court also does not give absolute claim. Like the complete claim, even in liquidated damages, are not uh, awarded back to the parties, one. And when you already claim the liquidated amount, uh, you would then also kind of cut yourself from claiming loss of reputation or emotional claims and all. In the light of this, do you still suggest liquidated damages? Um, I'm not sure how US and French courts would deal with this situation. But this is something practically that we always see in India. And uh, also my second question might be a little out of the scope of your uh, thesis, the research work, but have you also examined the enforcement procedures and what the right amount that parties finally get in their hands? So, uh, I mean, where I understand that it's not always what courts award, but ultimately the answer should be what parties are getting in their hand. So are these two scopes that are considered in the paper? Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very good question. I have no answer for the second one. No, we didn't uh, survey at all the enforcement part. And you're right, in particularly in international setup, it's very difficult to enforce, or more difficult to enforce the, the ruling. So not, no answer for this one. On liquidated damages, if I understand well your question is the recommendation of 
considering those pattern of scale to input the liquidated damages clause in the contract is certainly a danger or double blade uh, weapon in case of moral damages. Yes, uh, however, you can, I mean, liquidate the damages by definition, considering you are still into a reasonable frame or range, are very free. Parties can just consider that they are partly expectation and partly uh, consequential damages, so including the moral uh, or reputation harm. If both parties agree in this clause to put such damage and justify it, including with non expectation damages that I, I don't think it's uh, it's uh, it's inappropriate but again I would refer to the to the lawyers in the different jurisdictions about that um, yeah can I ask yes uh, just one quick question so what happens in uh, various contracts which are like especially standard contracts uh, one party would be let's say a government in a particular jurisdiction uh, courts usually are seen to be a little reluctant in ordering the entire damage when it's against the government. So, A, I'm out of scope of claiming other damages, plus I cannot even claim the liquidated or, con or the pre-predicted uh, damage in my contract. So, in that case, it, do this just liquidated damages as a good source? No, I, I, I really, I'm sorry, I cannot uh, fully uh, answer in the case because you are describing a case of India. What I can tell you is both in the US and in France, liquidated damages are a more efficient way to get an outcome, but they can be revised in both laws by the judges if they are considered uh, obviously unreasonable. So you can try to be a little bit into the upper end if both parties agree and include some non-quantitative damages, if you wish, but not too much, otherwise there is a risk of requalifying. Just continue. Yes. Down. Well, the, the theory, the law says both up and down, but I never saw personally up. <laughs> down. No, 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 not to zero. No, 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 not to zero except if there is bad faith, in that case it's different. But if you agree on a liquidated damages clause and considering the circumstances, one party say, well, I'm sure uh, while litigating and I go to court, the judge consider that the circumstances damages are too high, yes, they would reduce. In theory, they are entitled to increase the damages, but personally, I didn't see that. Let me thank you. Um. Can you go back to slide uh, 10, I guess the first, um, the first plot? Mm. Yeah, this that one. one. So, you, know, you have said very little about this. Uh, how, do we, how do we understand these trends? Is this, um, the courts changing their rulings over time in the respective countries? Or is it the parties uh, adapting the, the, the claims that they're going to demand um, over time because they learn about you know, how these, how these um, cases are, de uh, are adjudicated? <coughs> My guess is both. So let me give you some background of France, for instance. Uh, you see in the early 90s, on the average, again, averages do not mean much, but still, 26%. 26% means of those cases which are granted something, only among those, you would get one out of four dollars you would claim. So this is, and, and there is an increase. I think here there is clearly a change of behavior of the courts, especially in terms of business law because money is becoming more and more, I would say, a non-taboo subject, and it was a taboo subject, especially in higher claims. So I would guess that judges are more uh, trained to that, but also 
uh, probably parties are more sophisticated. Again, specific performance is a default tool in France. So only very recently, I would say only 20 years ago, parties started to input some uh, expertise into their claims, except international claims, but this is, again, some outstanding cases. So there is also here a sign of a better uh, evidence or better demonstrative claim on the part of the parties. Uh, so on the, on the parties' point, um, coming back to the selection issues that uh, Avery raised, so is it possible that these changes over time are driven by selection? Um, I would say no, because we didn't use a different way of selecting whatever is good or bad this selection, but the selection process we used was the same over time. Oh, okay, so uh, then the assumption you are making is cases coming to litigation are the more... The sample changing. The sample changing. Well, this could explain why, partly could explain why U.S. is downward, but I'm not sure how this could explain the upward movement for France, right? Because if there is a different sample over time, then we would expect only the bad cases coming more and more, but it would not go upward for France, right? Uh, or maybe I'm missing something. How about an even simpler, uh, how about an even simpler uh, sample select? If you're to, you said you're looking at three different uh, types of contracts. If you were to plot them there, will we see an even distribution across the three different kinds? That's an even simpler uh, selection issue and then we can go to whether or not the parties are selectively different, uh, you know, are bringing different kinds of cases. Then we can also kind of examine judicial behavior. Excuse me, I think I missed your first part. You said if you plot the sample. If, if you plot the sample that with different colors, three different colors across three, three, three different situations. contracts, three different One, contracts two, three. across okay. those years, are we going to see an even distribution or are we going to see some shifts and changes too? Okay. That's, an e that's, a, that's a baseline, and yes. then after that, we can start asking different kinds of questions about right. different selection issues. Okay, so I can answer your first question. We would see different averages, but same pattern. So I, I give you just part of the, of the answer in the third box here. In situation one, we have an average better return, both for France and the US. Uh, on, on situation two, we have lower return because it's consequential damages and, and on this part of the claim, obviously. And new business is really very, very few return. So uh, we have different claim, different grant, different percentages, but the path would be downward. What we see is very consistent path downward for the US, very consistent path upward for France. Just to answer this first part. Now, your second uh, question is, is there an even distribution within each situation, you mean? Sure, across the years. I don't have the answer to this question. Let me put it a little bit differently. Uh, this, uh, this one suggests that all you have is the extremes. Either you got virtually nothing or you got almost everything from here. Right. And so, what it seems odd to see, see a trend down, which is basically saying that you, you used to get a lot of the things in the 80 to 100, now you're getting a lot of things in the 0 0.8. But that seems to be the big difference, that you're just getting more of the failures coming up uh, over time. Because you, the way, I mean, <coughs> the averages are extremely misleading because almost yes. nothing takes place yes. in that average area. So it's, it's just where you get more of the one type than the other type. Why you get more, we don't know. If, if I can add to that just a real similar question. I, I was struck by this at first because it does go against the intuition that judges are just cutting, cutting the cases in half. But then on the next slide, or it's slide 10, it seems that over time they are getting to the point where they are cutting things right down the middle. And so, again, averages, you know, who knows what averages are telling us. But it does seem like we're getting in the middle, whereas the data you were showing us on, on slide 8 
which isn't the same as this, right? We're looking at 60 observations versus okay. 153. So yes, I completely agree. Averages are no value, just as an index. But I was not surprised myself by the third box on the left. Because when I did the research, and I'm not inventing that, uh, PwC published uh, a very detailed analysis of international arbitration in 2014, I think. And they covered the last 25 years. So more or less the same type of time frame, only on international commercial arbitration. And it was exactly the same, uh, the same spread. So 80% of the cases are outside. So before reading this study, I was surprised because also I thought you know, most of the cases would be in between. It's not the case. And we confirmed that in France, in the US, in, in, in domestic litigation. So um, coming back to this trend, I think it's not easy to explain, but it's certainly not only a selection bias. It is an evolution of the judicial practice. It is an evolution of the business environment. I would argue even that some of the companies here, because this is an evenly spread sample between type of industries, manufacturing, distribution, high tech, construction, real estate, um, any kind of industry, any kind of size of companies from small individual companies to large uh, major multinationals. Answering your question, larger sizes go to uh, 232 million claims. So we have also very large claims, but they are very exceptional. So I would argue that there is more and more communication in terms, and those companies, especially the large ones, are having themselves international cases, international litigation. So I don't see why we could not assume that the methodologies, that the patterns, if they exist, are actually globalizing or globalized. Well, let me just follow up on this. Here, from slide eight, we basically get, I want to come back to slide 10, but from slide eight, essentially in the first part we might call zero, okay? That, uh, and the last one, 100%. Part of it is zero, part of it is in between, yeah. So then you come back to slide 10. If it, what you're saying is that uh, in, in 1989, 80% no. of the cases yeah. gave something and in, in 19 whatever, 54%. No. no, no, I'm sorry, maybe I was not clear. This slide shows all the cases where we have the documentation, so 153 cases, okay? On this one, oh, sorry. On this one, we have only those who are granting something. We have actually eliminated all the cases which are not granting anything. And we do the analysis of the grant to claim ratio only when liability was found on the defendant and the claimant was granted something. So it's not the same ratio than this one, right? Because here we have also the zero. Okay. So yeah, maybe it's a misleading uh, figure, but slightly different. Oh, yeah. Again, again, I think the theory and the, the methodology we have used is first identify when it is granted and then how much it is granted. Maybe in this, th in this slide, from, from now on, you can have zero as one thing and then one yes, to 20. Yes, exactly. I thought that this morning, but yeah, I think I should do it in the next slide. Could you return to 10 for a minute? Yeah. Yes. So uh, actually, there is a paper, no reason for you to know it, but it's on S the SSRN. Maybe you know it. It's What's the name? It's a paper of uh, Peter Siegelman and Alexis Lahab. Now, what they show, it's it's forthcoming paper, but again, what they show that in the U.S., approximately in the years that you have here, I don't remember the exact years, actually they saw this trend in U.S. with respect to plaintiffs in general. So actually what they... Tort and contract? No, no, in total. total. They actually, all fields. Very interesting. What they show, yeah, and they have all kind of. Ex actually, it's a striking uh, findings. You know, they show exactly something very similar to the red line that we have here. At a certain point, actually, it becomes flat. Okay. So here, you do, it's not flat, but it's, it's uh, becoming so flat. Actually, there is a, there a decline approximately in the years. That, so what I'm saying here that in US, what we see here, at least according to their paper, seems to be a kind of a general trend in in suits brought in the United States. It is quite interesting. 
happy to hear that. Okay. Thank you. I would like the reference. Which year was that? I, it's a, it's a, again, then it's on the SSRN. It's new paper. Just they posted it like a ah, okay. couple so of months ago. Okay, so that's why probably I missed, yeah, I missed again, it, but I should. Peter Siegelman from Connecticut and uh, Lexis uh, uh, Lab. Now, uh, but so, but my question is this. Um, so, could you? L uh, is it possible using your data to see any relationship between the level of, say, uh, wrongdoing or blameworthiness or maliciousness of? the breaching party and the amount of damages. And the, sec uh, and the second question, which is very much related, probably I think that for the second one, maybe the answer would be that you cannot look at it, which is uh, the, um, the level of, um, of uh, persuade or uh, so to what extent, uh, so whether the evidence, so to what extent the evidence showing the uh, the breach was strong enough, right? You could imagine a situation in which the question of whether there was a breach or not is uh, by the proponents of the evidence, but slightly above the 50%, while in other cases it's much more. Because you could make an argument that when the court is more persuaded about the wrongdoing, it might be also more generous with respect to the amount of damages. Yes, I, I would say yes. We didn't do a quantitative analysis about wrongdoing. First, I think, because I thought that in contract law, it should not be a point. I have learned that. I mean, I mean you there you are inadvertent breaches, and there are intentional, malicious, opportunistic. Right, no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm obviously just provoking. It's actually right. very clear. But we didn't make the analysis. We have as I said, five to six cases where the court consider it so obvious that they uh, actually wrote that in the ruling. And those cases are actually outliers. They go much above, much on, uh, more than the pattern we have identified. So one of the reason is probably because of the wrongdoing, for sure. Um, and we have exactly the contrary also in, or not the contrary, it's related, in situations where there is a very good demonstration, very sophisticated demonstration, and the claimant actually gets nothing for a strange reason, probably related to bad faith. So this is somehow related questions. I'm per personally uh, very interested to go forward with this if there are some, um, some research papers. As I said, I would like to go into behavioral analysis, and I think the behavioral is both from the party side, from the methodology side, and also from the judge, how they perceive the behavior. I think this is a very uh, key value for the future of contract law. But for the moment, it's not really well covered here. Frank, thank you very much. Thank you.